This is the podcast for legal and ethical aspects of mental health nursing. Clients receiving psychiatric or mental health care have basic rights, just like everyone else does. Here are a list of them. They're a little hard to read, but you can peruse through this, so please feel free to stop the podcast and take a look at these. Because of the loss of important freedoms that occur to clients with psychiatric disorders in treatment facilities, the courts and advocates of clients with psychiatric disorders closely guard and value these rights that the clients retain. There are a few legal and ethical terms that I just wanted to make sure that you understood. One is the, um, the term of autonomy. Autonomy is the right to make a decision for oneself. Veracity is honesty and truthfulness in speech. Fidelity is faithfulness to the duties and obligations and promises one makes. Beneficence is doing the greatest good. And justice is equitable sharing or giving of benefits. One of the things that is an ethical and can be a legal dilemma of someone um, in a mental health facility is the application of restraints and the use of seclusion. So restraints would be tying someone down, okay, or restricting their movement in some way, usually their wrists and, and, and or ankles. Seclusion is a room where someone is put where they are all by themselves with nothing but a mattress on the floor. These types of things are high risk and can result in injury or death of the patient especially in children, adolescents, and the elderly. Legally, they're high risk because they inhibit the right to freedom. Now, if you can't move your arms or legs or you're locked in a room, that is inhibiting your right to freedom. Most times, clients perceive this as a form of punishment. As nurses, with restraints and seclusion, there are very specific guidelines we use as far as um, receiving an order, and renewing an order for restraints or seclusion and the way we document also. The nursing profession has long um, espoused advocacy for clients as one of its most important roles. Discussing rights within the treatment team, including these rights in their nursing care plans, and ensuring that facility and unit policies and procedures include methodologies for protecting client rights are examples of advocacy-oriented nursing interventions. Okay? We need to make sure that we are a very big advocate for our clients, especially in the mental health facility where most of the time their rights are limited. One of the ways we can do this is informed consent. So what is informed consent? Well, it's the consent that a recipient of health care gives to treating providers when he or she receives sufficient information that enables the recipient to understand a proposed treatment or procedure. Whew. That's a lot of words for basically it's telling um, it's the provider gives the patient enough information that they can make um, they can make a choice about the treatment they've received after they have heard all of the benefits and risks and side effects. So on this slide here are, is sufficient information about what informed consent is. So the way the treatment or procedure will be administered. So what they're going to do, what the prognosis is, what the side effects are, what the risks are, what the consequences of refusing the treatment, and then any other alternatives to that procedure that might be beneficial. Okay, so is this statement true or false? Administration of treatments or procedures without a client's informed consent can occur legally in mental health care facilities. This one is a resounding false. Administration of treatments or procedures without a client's informed consent can result in legal action against the primary provider, the health care agency, and the nurse. So there are evolving legal rights. Legal rights are always evolving, the, uh, to the, hopefully to the betterment of the patient. Um, evolving legal rights that are afforded to clients with psychiatric illness include the right to treatment, 
the right to treatment in the least restrictive environment, so that goes back to um, uh, seclusion and restraints, the right to refuse treatment, and the right to aftercare. When clients with psychiatric disorders are hospitalized, the type of admission determines the treatment plan. So here are, there's three really specific types of um, admissions. One is a voluntary admission. So this is a client who requests or agrees to hospitalization when, um, when that is offered to them. So they're going of their own accord. An emergency admission is a client who acts in a way that indicates that they are mentally ill and they may be a threat to self or others. So this is usually an involuntary commission, but um, or admission, but it could be voluntary. But it's an emergency because they are actively mentally ill and may be a threat to themselves or others. The last type is an involuntary admission. So this is a client who refuses to go to the hospital or get treatment but poses a danger to themselves or others and is mentally ill. This is when, with the um, assessment of two physicians, they can put a patient in the hospital or in a psychiatric facility for usually an indefinite duration against their will. Um, and they must stay there, they cannot leave. Usually, like I said, it's indefinite. It can be an indefinite time, but most of the time that varies depending on the state um, and it usually runs around three weeks give or take a little. Okay, so question. Which of the following is a right of a client with voluntary admission status and a mental health facility? A, the client is considered competent. B, the client has absolute right to refuse treatment excluding psychotropic drugs. C, the client has an absolute right to discharge at any time. D, the client has a right to come and go in the facility without restrictions. Well, it doesn't say anything here about um, being otherwise, so we must consider the client competent, okay? But that's not a right of them, that's just the way that it is. So the answer is actually, um, well, B deals with the fact that um, voluntary clients do have certain rights that differ from those of other hospitalized clients. Specifically, they are considered competent unless otherwise adjudicated or means which or otherwise said so by the court and therefore have the absolute right to refuse treatment including psychotropic drugs unless they are dangerous to themselves or others so even B is not really correct so that would have to be including psychotropic drugs in order to be correct voluntary clients do not have an absolute right to discharge at any time but may be required to request discharge so like let somebody know ahead of time basically. And D is not right because a client has, um, the, any client does not have the right to come and go in the facility without restrictions. Here's a little case study for you to ponder over. Now you may pause again here to read at your own leisure but um, I'm going to go on. All right, there are some special client populations that we're gonna talk about here, and the first one is forensic client. So what is a forensic client? Um, that's a defendant, okay? So this is somebody that's done something wrong, and we're gonna talk about whether or not the client is um, mentally ill or not, and whether they knew what they were doing. So the forensic client is the defendant. Mental health professionals um, get involved in their care including the understanding about the evaluation of competency to stand trial. So are they competent to stand trial? And the evaluation of the defendant's mental condition at the time of the alleged crime, if the defendant pleads and is acquitted on an insanity defense, then it's the bottom half of the slide here. So basically, if the client is competent to stand trial, then they can assist the attorney with defense, they do understand the nature and the consequences of the charge against him or her, so they understand what they did and what's going to happen to them, and they understand the courtroom procedures. If they plea insanity or mental illness, then they are admitted involuntarily to a psychiatric facility for a certain period of time in order to be evaluated. 
and then once they are evaluated, then they will go back um, to stand trial. The other special client population is minors, and minors are anyone under the age of 18. And if you are, if you are a minor, um, it can put limits on your um, requirement of hospitalization for admission. So this is an important advocacy point on behalf of pediatric clients with mental illness. So you can't say that a five-year-old has mental illness and is stuck in a facility for the rest of their lives. If a client, a minor client, um, is involved in some kind of, of issue relating to mental health, then the court has the, has the duty to balance those interests between the rights of the parents and the guardians to control the lives of their children with the right of the children to due process before their freedom is taken away. Whenever you're caring for clients, there are boundaries that must be maintained in order to um, uphold ethical nursing care. So this is especially true for our clients in a mental health facility. Okay? These would be things like assault and battery. Okay? Assault is the threatening of harm of a patient and battery is the actual physical harming of a patient. Um, there are sexual boundaries. There are um, informational boundaries that we must maintain. A lot of times these, uh, these clients that have mental illness cannot maintain these own boundaries okay, for, because of the disease process or for whatever reason. So it is up to us as the healthcare providers that we must maintain these boundaries. So any violation of these boundaries are insidious. They're just downright criminally wrong um, for us, anyhow, because we know better. Just like, you know, you wouldn't say, oh, well, the client doesn't know, so I'm going to take their money, okay? Or, oh, you know, a client doesn't know any better, so I'm going to sexually molest them. Um, or, you know, the client doesn't know any better, so I'm going to withhold food or water or other medications. Or, you know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to hit them or threaten them because they just don't know any better, so I can do whatever I want to. Okay, so that's what it means that those types of boundary violations are just, you know, extremely wrong. We as nurses must take responsibility for evaluating and maintaining these boundaries in our nurse-client relationships. I mean, that's our responsibility. Our clients that have psychiatric disorders and mental health problems are highly vulnerable and most of the time, you know, can't take care of themselves. So that's part of our duty and our job is to take care of them because they can't. And here are just two, the last two slides have to do with questions for you to think about. So here's one and the last. So this ends the podcast on legal and ethical considerations in mental health care. And again, I leave you with the fact that, you know, we are the professional here and we need to make sure that we are advocating for our patients and that we treat them in, in an ethical manner and that we very much monitor their legal rights um, as well as their ethical rights in the care that we give them. And the last thing is making sure that we maintain our boundaries so that we don't overstep the line and cause more harm to our patients or harm to ourselves or our families.